can do to improve it? So in this study, it was done with health care team members, so doctors, nurses, um, care management people, social workers, just an interdisciplinary team. And it was a focus group that asked them, why do you think that patients distrust the health system? Why do you think that they don't take the meds when they're asked to? Why do you think that they use the emergency department instead of um, visiting their primary care providers? And the, the, there were recurrent themes as to what the healthcare providers thought um, was a reason for this distrust, and some of them included um, no access to healthcare, no access to transportation, not being able to understand the discharge instructions, not being able to navigate the confusing healthcare system. There was also another study put out um, where they did the same thing but with patients. So we asked the patients, why do you distrust the healthcare system? Why don't you go to the primary care provider? Why do you use the emergency department instead of going to primary care? <coughs> and long story short, it was found that the patients pretty much said the same thing. They don't have access to transportation. For example, someone who is a new amputee um, isn't able to get transportation and take them to the hospital. Or they don't have enough healthcare. They might have healthcare, but not um, enough to um, enable them to see primary care all the time or get the services that they need. Um, the patients also pointed out that the healthcare system is very confusing and if they, would, if they were able to have someone to help them navigate the system, that they would use the, use the resources better. And so how do we bridge the gap? So now that I presented all of this, it's great that we all know about this, we're all aware of it, but how do we fix this problem with our patients? Does anyone have any suggestions? IRPs. Hmm? IRPs. Institutional review boards. Okay. You know, physician level, you can try to, if our patients are saying that it's confusing, we can try to do better and try to explain a little bit more so they can trust us. Uh, spend more money on research and, and help on instituting the uh, or addressing the actual social determinants of health rather than just uh, you know, waiting for someone to come in. Yes, yes. Resources that are aimed at community outreach and education, um, both to help help literacy, but also just to provide assistance in navigating the system, knowing how to use it. Similar to any other problem, uh, first is being aware of the interests and why, um, mm -hmm. and then maybe spending a little more time on the bedside, or you know, explaining why a patient may or may not be the SET as opposed to just telling them that they're fine um, mm -hmm. and actually acknowledging what their underlying concerns may be. Mm -hmm. Well, and just being aware of increasing representation, from, uh, you know, not just in terms of African Americans, but many different groups. It's probably the most diverse residency program on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that's something, that's something I'm always very proud of. <laughs> <coughs> we have individuals in this room that are going to be leaders in you know, programs around the country, around the world. So keep that in mind, having representation. We are having individuals conducting research, uh, educating future healthcare providers, so having this in mind, I think that was really good. Okay. So, yeah, I agree with all of you guys. So we need to take a patient centered approach to care as opposed to a disease centered approach. So someone has high blood pressure, <coughs> instead of focusing on the disease, because we know that, for example, my mother, she's not gonna take her meds, right? She'd rather drink ginger tea for her meds. So you tell her, hey, um, yeah, ginger tea might help, so I, I recommend that you drink it, but you know, also take your water pill every day. You know? Um, you have a diabetic patient who keeps coming in, in DKA, or keeps coming in with high finger sticks, and then you ask them, you know, are you keeping a diabetic diet? <coughs> well, doc, you know, honestly, I, I had some jerk chicken um, last night. 
but okay, you know, next time try having just just a drumstick as opposed to the whole thing. You know, so just like work in with your patients, <laughs> right? Um, also recognizing that um, um, the needs of um, our patient population here, and um, just understanding the culture. We have a large um, Caribbean American population, and um, just recognizing some of the cultural aspects of um, the Caribbean American culture. So different behaviors. There are different behaviors that um, providers can take on to help establish rapport with their patients and in turn um, develop trust with their patients. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a list of things that are available to patients in New York State that we should all be aware of. Because sometimes our patients come in and they really come in for social issues. So it would be nice to know these things and to tell them where to go for help. So immig the immigrant population, a lot of people are scared to tell the doctor that they're Immigrants, a lot of people are scared to say that they're here illegally because they feel like there's nothing available to them. Don't read this, but there's multiple things available. Um, immigrants are um, able to get emergency shelter if they need it. They're able to get um, school breakfast and lunch for free. They're able to get senior services, public transportation, Medicaid for all children under 19, and for some adults over the age of 19, depending on what the, the disease process is. And there's many other things. Um, for example, pregnant women, regardless of immigration status, are um, able to get Medicaid for um, prenatal care as well as um, hospital care. Um, we see patients who unfortunately pass away. Um, and some of them don't have money to pay for the burial. So the HRA actually provides financial assistance for um, individuals who, need, who, in, who are in need of it. So it's not something that we would know like everything about it, but it's just something, it's just good to know that these things are available and you can refer them to social work. So for example, if you're in CCT and patient dies and family members are, um, you know, ask you about burial stuff, you can refer them to social work and say, well, you know, um, New York State has this thing where they can help you with the expenses if, you, if you're not able to. And this is called a WIC check. Um, these are checks that are given to pregnant women and breastfeeding women. Um, and they provide, like, as you can see here, like tuna fish, cereal, peanut butter, milk, eggs, um, other such things that a pregnant woman needs to nourish her body and to grow a healthy fetus. Um, the state of New York also provides a health box. Um, which is like little certificates that um, patients can take to farmers markets in order to buy fruits and vegetables. So like your patients who say they can't eat healthy because they can't afford it, well these things are available. Um, food stamps are also available. This is just a copy of what um, the Medicaid card will look like um, and this is available to many people and they're not aware of it. So a lot of patients come to um, the ED with like these vague complaints. Oh, I have this pain in my belly, but I'm not tender, and I'm worried because my brother had colon cancer last year, my mother died of breast cancer, and they're coming to the ED for their care because they don't have health insurance, they have no other way of screening themselves. Downstate provides free cancer screening. I didn't know this. I only found out a few days ago while I was doing research. But you can refer these patients to Downstate, um, and this is the number that they can call. You can just Look it up on the website if ever you need to. It is warm this January, but usually around this time it's freezing. Some people don't have heat. Some people have to resort to turning on their ovens um, to heat their homes. And we see a lot of these people, well not now, but usually when it's cold, we see them come in with headaches, like even carbon monoxide. Um, well, they don't need to do this. Um, New York State actually has an energy assistance program known as HEAT. As heat that um, patients can also be referred to. Right? So these are some of the things that are available to our um, patient population. Another way that we can help bridge the gap between provider and patient is to take care of them in an interdisciplinary sort of team. So we kind of do that at Kings County, right? And we kind of do that at Downstate. So the provider sees the patient, if they have high blood pressure or diabetes, I hope everyone's doing that. You call care management to come talk to them and make sure that their needs are being met at home. Um, also, if you have any concerns about the patient needing home health care or any such services at 
home, you can call the social worker. Um, you can also call the social worker or the AOD to help with transportation for the patient if you believe that the patient will not be able to make it home safely. Another way to bridge the gap is to respect patient's privacy. Um, for example, trauma baby. Um, 25 year old male comes in gunshot wound. Um, I've noticed on multiple occasions that um, the door is left wide open, the curtain is left wide open, um, the patient's clothes are being ripped off of him, his, his entire body is naked, and there's like other patients walking around, peeking into the room to see what's going on. Um, and that really like, shouldn't happen, right? Like, we, we should try to remember to respect patient's privacy, even in a trauma bay. Um, pull the curtain, um, put a sheet over them, tell them what you're doing, um, because you wouldn't want that to, to happen to you if you, if you got into the, the trauma. Another way to respect patient's privacy is to use the interpretive bones. I know it's a pain, sometimes you can't find it, sometimes it takes a while before an interpreter comes on the phone. Um, but using a patient's family member or children to interpret for them um, is kind of a violation of privacy because there might be like sexual parts of their sexual history and other things that they don't want their family members to know that they wouldn't tell you because you're using them as, um, as an interpreter. We also need to recognize our implicit biases. So we kind of went over that in the 2016 study that shows how the healthcare providers still carry these biases even though they don't think that they do. <coughs> this is another um, paper um, that was done on this topic. Um, it was released in 2015 and it was pretty much just a systematic review of about five other papers that um, that studied the exact same thing. So these were all like focus groups where they um, asked like healthcare providers about implicit biases. And the results of this study is that um, there were higher levels of implicit bias against blacks, Latinos, and um, dark skinned people. And it also showed that because of these implicit biases, um, provider patient interactions were negatively um, impacted and um, treatment decisions, treatment adherence was also negatively um, impacted. So even he's gonna get pain from time to time, right? So if he shows up to the emergency department, even though he looks like you know, a typical drug seeker, you have to take what he says seriously. Because pain is something that you can't really tell. If, you can't really tell if someone is really in pain. Um, so you kind of have to listen to your patients and treat them all equally. Shared decision making is also an important way of bridging the gap between patient and provider. So instead of telling the patient, well, you have a history of high blood pressure diabetes, you're coming in with chest pain, you're getting admitted. Okay, see you later. <laughs> you can tell them, well, okay, you're 50, you have high blood pressure and diabetes, you smoke, and you're coming in with pain that's concerning me for chest pain. So I know you have work tomorrow, so we can try to get two sets of cardiac enzymes and send you home, or we can keep you overnight. You know, it's up to you. Um, you know, having this discussion with the patients actually helps them feel like they're involved in their care and it helps them um, develop more of a trust towards you and the healthcare system in general. And also, like, include the families in the decision process <laughs> if the patient wants to. I know sometimes the families come barging in and they're like, yeah, can you tell me what's going on with my, with my brother? And you're like, your brother's 20. I, I don't need to, like, but just um, remember that some patients um, value their family's opinion. So if someone comes to you and asks for medical information on a family member, you can say, okay, um, I'll come discuss it with you in front of the patient. And that way we can all have a decision together. And this is just an article that examined um, shared decision making in the emergency department, a systematic review. And um, the results of this study, um, so it was done on five different, so the systematic review was in five different articles. Four of them were pediatrics, and one of them was adult. 
But the results show that um, shared decision making led to increased patient adherence, um, increased trust in the <coughs> physician, and it also um, concluded that um, it is possible to perform shared decision making in a busy emergency department environment. So also providing culturally relevant care. Um, if you have a female patient who doesn't want a male patient to examine her, then you respect that. Um, for example, the jerk chicken um, example that I gave earlier, just knowing your patients um, culturally and trying to work with them, and trying to work with them. So informed consent. Um, the way that works in the emergency department is a lot of patients sometimes get admitted and don't know that they're admitted to the hospital, or a lot of patients have like certain tests ordered on, ordered on them that they're not aware of. Um, so try to get in the habit of saying, okay, you're admitted. And they just pop it into the room and saying, okay, you're admitted, or okay, my plan is to admit you. Because many times on rounds, I don't know if anyone else has had that experience, you think, oh, 14 left is admitted for chest pain. And patient goes, what? <laughs> so, um, trying to get in the habit of keeping the patient well informed um, will go a long way to help um, bridge that gap between physician and provider. And this is not all going to happen overnight. It's going to take generations for this culture and these beliefs and, this, and these beliefs to go away. But we can do our part by starting today. So these are just some miscellaneous points. Like talk to the patients. Um, for example, the sickle cell patients. So they say, oh, regular pain? Okay, six and, six and 50. You know, go talk to them and have a conversation and figure out exactly why they're here today. Um, some patients, all they want is food. Like they get, you know, angry because they've been waiting so long, you know, they, and um, all, all, all they needed was some food. So offer them some food, offer them a sandwich, get them water, respect their privacy, make sure that your colleagues, the consultants who are coming down to the emergency department are also respecting their privacy and um, do not jump to conclusions. So not all the male trauma patients are, were up to no good. You know, sometimes people were minding their business standing outside the door and got shot. So with that in mind, this leads me to my conclusion. The United States has had a long history of questionable medical, medical practice within minority communities. It's not just this key. It's not just the syphilis experiments. We can help alleviate this mistrust by um, providing patient-centered care, providing culturally relevant care, and practicing medicine in inter interdisciplinary teams. And just also be knowledgeable about helpful resources that might be beneficial to your patients. As my references, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me and listened to my um, <coughs> presentation. And um, that's it.